real uh, inspiration and encouragement to me, and I appreciate him. So we had a great service and great outpouring of the Spirit of God. I hope and pray that you're praying for that for next week, this coming week. Um, I haven't announced it yet, but I uh, uh, want to welcome Facebook, first of all. God bless you for joining us tonight. Um, but Pastor Bob Layton's not feeling well. He's had a very, very severe sinus infection that he got over while he was in Israel uh, two days before he left to come home. Um, he's been battling uh, that for a while since he's been home. Very heavy medication, very strong antibiotics. So Linda and I was discussing that. We think we're just going to tell him to stay home next week and just kind of recuperate. And when it gets a little bit warmer, we'll have him come. So um, just stuck with me, I guess. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to continue our Bible study on healing damaged emotions. And um, what we're going to talk about tonight, I'm just going to go over this slide here. <clears throat> and that's um, what we're talking about is bitterness. And the first thing we were talking about is the bitterness is a root. Um, but the um, cause of bitterness is what? We all should know that by now, right? What? What is it, Jeanette? What are we learning? What are we learning about? What have we learned on Wednesday? What is the root of bitterness? Nobody tell her. I want her. Did you write it down? No, we didn't have that last week. No. We didn't have a week before either. It was a week before that. See, you've got to get this because if you don't get this, it's not going to be effective in your life. The root of bitterness is unforgiveness. We've been talking about that over and over again. It's, it's unforgiveness. It begins with unforgiveness. Yep, you got it. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> what happens next is... is Begins with unforgiveness, but it sends in spirits of resentment. Then retaliation, then anger, then hatred, then violence, then murder. If it's not, if it's not dealt with. Now, a lot of people say, "Well, I would never murder anybody," but the Bible says, "If you have hatred toward your brother, guess what? You have hatred. You have committed murder." See, the outward commandments or the Ten Commandments have to do with outward action. But Jesus made it more personal when he brought it into the heart. And he said that if you even, you know, if you even uh, have hatred in your heart toward a brother, it's as if you've committed murder. It's, the, it's in the same penalty, by the way, too. So what happens is it sends in a spirit. I'm getting a little, you can just, no, it's not rubbing my shirt because it's not rubbing on my shirt. It's, it's just too loud. Just a bit. Okay, that's good. Because I can raise my voice, so that'd be good. All right. So it sends in a spirit of resentment. You begin to resent things. Um, a lot of times, what happens is when these things are not dealt with, especially when you have a melancholy temperament. If you have a melancholy temperament, where she was a melancholy temperament is a person who's laid back, really not. Does things don't seem to be bothering them? It goes, you know, they kind of they go in one ear and out there, but actually they're stirring it up inside. So a melancholy temperament just keeps taking and taking. But when they do explode, let me tell you, it can be very, 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 very dangerous. And those are the kind of people you got to watch out for. Okay, but it sends in a spirit of resentment, and then from there goes to retaliation, then from there anger, then hatred. And then uh, vengeance, or violence, then murder. Roots of bitterness must be dug out one memory at a time. It's not, it's not magic. It's not a magic wand. You just wave it over yourself and it's all set. No, these are things that sometimes we have to go back and we have to kind of think of, well, you know, 30 years ago, somebody did something to me. And, uh, you know, I forgave them. 
But every time that memory comes back in your mind, there's that little irritation in your in your heart and your spirit. Well, if that irritation, that thing is in your heart still, you haven't truly forgiven. And so therefore, you need to reevaluate those things. Um, and uh, I don't want to get too much on this because I want to really move in tonight to self-bitterness. Because so many people are caught up with self-bitterness. Uh, if there is an emotional and even physical pain in a memory, there is still bitterness. When all negative emotion is gone, peace comes, and you can take back the ground from Satan. But you have to do that. I can't do it for you. Your counselor can't do it for you. Psychologist can't do it for you. Medication can't do that for you. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, those things help. But ultimately, unless you take ownership of these things and you deal with them, then it's not going to benefit you at all. The antidote for bitterness is forgiveness. And you know what, what really sometimes boggles our mind is that a person can do a real rotten thing to you. I mean, something really bad to you. And you hold the unforgiveness and you hold bitterness and all these resentment and all these things in your heart. And you know what happens? That other person's walking around free as a bird, carefree, doesn't care, doesn't, doesn't seem to care about anything. And yet you're the one that's being hurt, you're, you're still being hurt, you're still hashing it over, over and over and over and over again in your mind and in your heart. And so what happens is, is, is that they're walking free and you're bound. And so it's not worth it. It's not worth it to have that in your life. So the antidote to bitterness is forgiveness. Let me, ask, let me say this. Forgiveness is a free will it's not a feeling. It's not a feeling. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Well, i got to feel it. No, you don't. Nowhere does it tell you you have to feel it. What you have to do is forgive. It's, it's, it's part of your free will and choice to forgive. Some people say, well, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget. And then you won't forgive. The ultimate person who forgives us of our sin, the Bible says he throws in the sea of forgetfulness. Okay. And, and I can tell you from personal experience, there are things that I have done in the past that something will trigger that. And I'll say, man, I, I used to do that. I forgot all about that. I used to be like that. I used to do that. Because you're a new person. You're not the same. I was having this discussion on Facebook today with, some, with somebody. <clears throat> and I was saying that <clears throat> we were talking about the homosexual issue that's going on. And, you know, so many preachers today are not dealing with that same-sex attraction. And I said, listen, don't tell me that you can't change. Because when you accept Christ, you are a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. You have a new nature. God's given you another nature. And so don't tell me you can't change. Some people say, well, you know, this is the way I am. I can't change. No, you can change. The problem is you won't change. So God wants us to change. And now God has to deal with us if we don't want to change. That's what we got to do. We got to ask God to help, help us to want to change. So forgiveness is a free will. It is a choice. You choose whether you want to forgive or not. Forgiveness is an act of obedience. <coughs> Excuse me. Forgiveness is an act of obedience. How is it an act of obedience? Can anyone tell me why forgiveness is an act of obedience? It's an act of obedience because God says to do it. 
And because God's word says forgive, and you shall be forgiven. You know, I, I like that scripture in Ephesians. It says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Forgiving one another, for even, as, for even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So forgiveness is an act of obedience. Unforgiveness is an act of disobedience. This is going to come in very, ha ha uh, very helpful when you start dealing with issues about loving yourself, forgiving yourself. Some people say, well, I can never forgive myself for what I've done. Let me tell you something. If you feel that way, then you're greater than who God is because God said he forgives. And you set yourself up above God when you say, I will not forgive myself. Or you have that act of disobedience of not forgiving yourself. We're going to get into that later on. God, uh, forgiveness sets you free, not the perpetrator. God, it says, forgiveness sets you free, not the perpetrator. In other words, sometimes we think, well, if I forgive him, he's just going to go on his way and do his own. Well, guess what? He's still going to be responsible until he repents. When he stands before God, God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. That's a promise that God has. When you take vengeance out of your, uh, away from yourself, when you deal with the bitterness that leads to that, and you deal with that, guess what? Now vengeance is God's. Now God can come and intervene. As long as you take your hands off of it. Amen? Forgiveness is to occur 70 times 7. In other words, continually as God forgives us. Wow. So that's 490 times. Now, I always say this, 490 times, but if it's the same thing, then there's behavior that needs to be corrected. Forgiveness is our breastplate of righteousness that covers our past and our protection against further bitterness. So, getting free of bitterness to get each memory, um, forgetting, I'm sorry, forgetting free of bitterness, go to each memory where there is pain. You can't see that? Oh, go back to the other slide then. That's all you have to tell me is go back. I'll give it to you. Okay. You can't see that? Okay, well, okay come sit over here. Come closer. And that's why I wanted everybody to come closer so that way you could see the slides because that's a lot of information and I can't. Oh, okay. Well, if you want, I can always have these printed out and give them to you if you miss them, but I'm not going to make you lazy either. If you want to take notes, that's great. But if I wait for you all to ca carry all the notes, and guess what? I'm going to be here just standing here looking pretty on Facebook. I'll get you. I'll get you copies if you want copies. So, getting free of bitterness, you go to each memory where there's pain. Forgive those who wounded you. Forgive them. Release them. You're releasing them from your judgment here, but you're not. Re necessarily releasing them from judgment from God. Because you want to be free. Your heart wants to be clear. You want to grow in Christ. <coughs> Let me take some water. You don't want to be walking around in bondage. You want to be free. See, if you have unforgiveness, you won't grow. You'll stay stagnant. not going to grow. You harbor that stuff in your heart. And I know sometimes people have treated us badly and people have done things to us. And, 
But also, we have also contributed by our foolish mistakes. Things that we've done against God. Going against God's will. Doing things that God said not to do, and we go ahead and do it anyway. And then we reap what we sow. <clears throat> and a lot of times we're blaming God for things when it's actually our choices of what we choose. But even in that, even when we've done stupid things like that, God still forgives. Amen? Praise God. Take back from Satan the ground you have given him. Repent of any sinful response you made to them. I should have said that one first. Repent for any sinful response you may you made to them. Whatever that situation was, whatever sinful response. Now, I don't think anyone here would ever get so angry where you would cuss. Now, I haven't sworn in a long, 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 long time, but a couple of times some things came out of my mouth and I said, ooh, it just came out. I was like, God, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't mean, I didn't mean that. Huh? Yeah, sometimes you can even say it in your mind. You know? When that guy cuts you off and almost smashes into your car. Huh? Take back from Satan the ground that you have given him because that's where he operates. Everything that is opposite of what God does, Satan does. God says to forgive, Satan says don't forgive because in his knowledge that if he gets you to not forgive, he knows you're not going to grow, you're not going to have a relationship with God. He knows that. And so that's what he's trying to prevent. And he speaks to you and he tells you, don't forgive that. That's, you know, that's, that's unforgivable. You can't, do, you can't forgive that person for what they've done. So take back the ground that the enemy has stolen through that unforgiveness. And you pray that prayer that way. Ask the Holy Spirit to heal your heart. Ask the Holy Spirit to heal your heart. Remember I was te teaching on, I was giving a message on your heart and how the heart stores memories? A lot of times it's not just from your head, but it's from your heart. Those thoughts and intents of the heart. You need to forgive from the heart, the Bible says. Forgive your brother or sister from your heart. And I think that's a lot of times where people struggle is they struggle because they, their mind, they think they're forgiving in their mind, but they're not forgiving from their heart. The thoughts that are in, uh, have been placed in your heart. And ask the Lord to tell you the truth about the situation. Ask the Lord to tell you, to show you the truth about the situation. Because sometimes it can be one way how many of you have ever done this? You've ever, and I've done this. You've ever read a text and you took it the wrong way? The person didn't mean anything by the text in which they texted, but because of an emotional response, uh, maybe something that you know was there, you kind of responded in a different way. And, and there's been a few times I've had to say sorry. I took your text the wrong way. You know, but some people too, they, they say that they didn't mean it that way, but they really did. You know, especially when they're using pronouns, you. <laughs> you know, they say, well, I was talking about someone else, but they say you. But anyway. When we apply the cross of Jesus Christ and forgive, wherever the pain is, and repent, wherever responsibility or conviction is, then the stress cycle is broken. Amen?
Amen? When we apply the cross of Jesus Christ, and that's dying to self, forgiving is dying to self, because self wants to go and knock their block off. Okay? Self wants to go over there and give them a kick. Self wants to go over there and take vengeance. But when we apply the cross of Jesus Christ and forgive, wherever pain is, and we repent, wherever responsibility or conviction is, then the stress cycle is broken because the memory is not revisited. And therefore, it's not relieved. We live, rather. You know, especially when something, a hurt is new, right? A hurt is new. You be How many times has this ever happened to you? Something happened in your life, and that night you went to bed, and it just kept playing over and over and over and over in your head, tossing, you're turning. You can't sleep because you keep, that thought just keeps going a, a million miles an hour in your brain, and it just keeps going over and over. And then you start hearing a little voice that says, yeah, you got to do something about this. Yeah, you gotta, you got to make sure they pay for this. All of these things happen, and they just keep going over and over again. Well, the way to stop that is when you apply the cross of Jesus Christ, forgive wherever pain is, and repent wherever responsibility or conviction is. Sometimes it may be something you said or something you did that triggered something else in someone else. And sometimes we need to do that. Homeostasis returns. Health is restored. Amen? Praise God. I want to talk about Next slide, I want to talk about I had it, but I lost it. Google it. It's the normal health. It's the normal, yeah, it's the normal region of health that you have. <coughs> Excuse me. So now we're going to move on from bitterness towards others. And what is, what, is bitter what is bitterness? What's the root of bitterness? Okay, now you got it. Keep it there. So self-bitterness is what? Self-bitterness is unforgiveness for itself. So the first thing we want to talk, show you is any way that we put ourselves down. Now, <clears throat> some of us have grown up, grown up in homes that are morally stable. You know, parents weren't drug addicts, parents weren't alcoholics, which is pretty far and few, but they're there. But there are many of us that have grown up in homes where we had not had positive influence in our home or in our life from the time we were small. And we put ourselves down because that's all you ever heard most of your life. What's the matter with you? Can't you do anything right? You're such a failure. I wish I never had you. Why don't you clean up? You're so ugly. Believe it or not, people say these things to people. And words can be a healing, as the scripture says to your bones. Or as the scripture says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. If I, if I kept saying, I hate your guts, I can't stand you. Because you're worthless. You're nothing. 
Those words have no power over you unless you believe them. Satan cannot take the words that you have or uh, people throw at you and make you do those things or feel that way unless you believe it. So the first thing you've got to deal with is believing the lies okay, that the enemy tells you. So any way that we put ourselves down is self-bitterness. Nothing. I'm never gonna. I'm never gonna amount to anything. Secondly, any memory that has shame, guilt, regret, or sorrow. Remember what I said. That when God forgives, He throws it in the sea of His forgetfulness. <clears throat> I preached the message one time. Scuba diving in God's sea of forgetfulness. We go scuba diving. We go looking for those old things, trying to drudge them up again. And I want you to be freed from this tonight. Listen to what I'm telling you. If you receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and you're truly born again, old things are passed away. Those old things are any memory that has shame, Guilt, regret, or sorrow. You can be free from those things because you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Any memory that has shame, guilt, regret, or sorrow from the past things that you have done before you were a Christian, or even as a Christian, when you ask God to forgive you, you must accept that forgiveness and you must shun any shame, guilt, or regret, or sorrow over a period of time. Now, I understand that godly sorrow leads to repentance. I understand that. Sometimes we are ashamed of the decisions and things that we've done. But that should not be a lingering factor in your life every single day where it makes you feel like you're worthless. Amen? So any memory that has shame, guilt, regret, or sorrow is a form of self-bitterness to your past. Anyway, number three, any way that we curse ourselves and thereby curse God because we are created in His image. We accuse God of making Hear me now. Any way that we curse ourselves. What's a curse? Think about that. What's a curse? Ooh, somebody cursed me. They hecked me. Here's a curse. My father was right. He said, I'll never amount to anything and I'm never going to be anything. Again, the words don't, can't do anything to you until you believe it. <clears throat> because once you believe it, as a man thinketh, so is he. Once you believe that lie, and it gets into your heart, and it gets into your spirit, you begin to curse yourself. I'll never amount to anything. My father's an alcoholic. His father was an alcoholic. His father was an alcoholic. I'm going to be an alcoholic. They never got free from it. I'm never going to get free from it. You believe that lie, you're trapped. You're stuck. You will continue doing those things and becoming those things that God had no intention of you becoming. Because the Bible says, he that hath begun a good work in you shall complete it. 
God is not in the business of unfinished business. God's word says if he's begun the work, he'll finish it. But he needs cooperation. He needs you and I to say, yes, Lord. Come on, start digging. Do some cultivating. Do some, some uh, removal of some things. Dig, dig deep. Another way, another way that we can see if we have self bitterness is is in the uh, the fourth thing. Any way that we disagree with what God has said about us in His Word. Any way that we disagree with what God has said about us in His Word. Remember I, I told you, I think it was a few weeks ago, I told you about if you want to change your future, you have to change your, op, you have to ch change your information base, which will change your operation base, which will give you a different result. But if you're hoping for a future, but you're stuck in your past, your, your future will never, never change. Because your past becomes your present, and your present becomes your future. The only way that will change is if you change the information base. And how you do that is believing what God said in his word about you. So uh, another test, if you will, of self-bitterness a person has, any way that we disagree with what God has said about us in his word. I'll give you an example. I have a friend of mine. I haven't talked to him in many, many years. His choice, not mine. <coughs> Excuse me. Christian for many years, over 30 years. Okay. Graduate of Bible school. Came out of Bible school and still believed that God didn't love him. Just couldn't wrap around how God could love him. He disagreed with what God says in his word. God's word says, I love you with an everlasting love. Accepting what God says and not coming in disagreement with what he says is to remove any self-bitterness that you might have against yourself. How could God ever love somebody like me? You're actually railing against God. Because God made you. Let's give an example of what God said. God said this. Give me a question. Yes? Okay. In Psalm 139, verse 14, he said, You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have a pastor, you don't know I'm, I've gained 40 pounds. And... That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the inner person. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. How many believe that? How many actually believe that? Did you say? Edie? No. No. No, the Bible says that his love is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. He has given us that love. He has given us that acceptance. He says that you are accepted in the beloved. It's a, it's a challenge, but we have to believe God's word. It's in your belief. It's not in... Well, we can't understand. No, it's not in understanding, sister. It's in believing what God said. God said those things. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. How he creates us, how um, you can do so many functions at different times. 
without even thinking about it. But it's believing God's word, not what I feel or what I think or, 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 or I, I can't. Yes, you can. God says you can do all things through Christ which strengthens. See, in other words, we depend so much on our own psychic abilities and our knowledge and our thinking that we don't believe God anymore. That's why America doesn't see miracles anymore. They don't believe God anymore. They'd rather go to a psychiatrist. They'd rather go to a, a psychologist. They'd rather take pills. I mean, I've seen, I've heard people go up in a healing line, okay, for healing, and they get to the point, of, and, the, and the preacher asked them, do you want to be healed? And they said, oh, be healed? He said, yeah, you want, to, you want to get prayed for? He goes, yeah, I want to be healed. When you get healed, are you on disability? Yes. Well, when you get healed, are you going to turn your check in? Oh, no, forget it. And they turn around and walk away. People don't believe God anymore. They really don't. They think they believe God. But God's word tells us who we are. We're nothing in and of ourselves. We understand that. We know and understand that in this flesh dwells no good thing. How many believe that? I believe that. Even me, apart from Christ, even the good that I have in me as a non-believer is still evil. I hear this all the time. Oh, he's not saved, but that's a good person. No, he's not. The Bible says there's none good. No, not one. And why isn't there good any good? Somebody tell me that. Why is there good not any good? Because it comes from the same tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's still from the fallen nature. The Bible says that the flesh cannot please God. See, we don't believe that. We talk about these scriptures, but we don't believe them. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have to believe God, and that's how he looks at you and I. Now, if you don't like that, argue with God. Don't argue with me. I'm not going to argue with you. The second thing God said, you are, listen to me, you are the apple of his eye. Woo, glory! You're the apple of his eye. That's special. You are the apple of his eye. Isn't that awesome, Grandma? <clears throat> Aren't you glad God is like, not like man? That when people get old, he just tosses you aside into a nursing home? No, you're still the apple of his eye. From the day you were born, Till the day that doctor gave you a whack. Maybe the nurse has got a few shots in too. I don't know. Oh, but from that very day you were born. And that gift of breath of life was in you. God had a plan. God knew where you would be right now today. Because you are the apple of his eye. The third thing he said. He's engraved you on his palm. Now, of course, we understand that to be figurative. You know, that's an anth what they call anthropomorphic expression. God's hand, which means that you are personal. He's personal. engraved in his being. He's created you. He is the creator. He has a deep, deep affection and love for you. If he didn't, why would he send his son to die for you? Think about that. If God didn't love you, why would he send his son to die for you? And the last one, 
Jesus died for us. No greater love than to have the man that he has shown that he would die for his friend. created in his image. So how do we get free? How do we get free of self-bitterness? First and foremost, make a list of all the bitterness that you have against yourself, all the regrets. Remember I told you it's one by one. It's not a blanket thing. But one by one, write them down. Some of your regrets, some of the mistakes, some of the things that you've done that you're reaping, the, you're reaping from it now. It has stunted your growth emotionally. Make a list of all the bitterness you have against yourself. And the first thing you do is confess and repent before God for believing the lies of the devil about yourself. Confess and repent before God for believing the lies of the devil. Remember, that's where the devil gets power from. When you believe his lies. <clears throat> when you believe his lies, then he'll lie to you more and more and more. One of the biggest lies he tells people in, in the world today is you don't need Jesus Christ. In fact, if you look at the philosophy, if you look at the psychology of the devil, he uses reverse psychology. Devil don't care. They don't care if you go to church and, and you uh, sit quietly and give money and all that. They don't care about that. He doesn't care if you hear the word preached. The only thing he cares about is if you believe it. If he can get you into a religion to make you feel good, and can I tell you that's what a lot of the church today is going down that road? The feel good church church, comfortable church, one that's not preaching the truth, What's one that's preaching the gospel of accommodation, gospel accommodates your lifestyle, you don't have to change, you can stay the same and God still will keep you and love you, and that's what the devil does, he lies to people, he's a liar, been a father of lies from the beginning. But oh, how he philosophizes that, and oh, how he comes with his psychology and trying to convince you that the way of Christ and the way of Christianity is not the right way, it's the wrong way. Oh, I don't need Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. And God's word says you need him. If it wasn't for his breath in your body, you wouldn't be alive. Then he lies to the young people. Tells them, oh, you can have your life. Live your life. You're going to miss out. Yeah. You're going to miss out, all right. You're going to miss out on 
pleasing God, doing things the right way, following the will of God. And all the gifts that God has for you, for your life to have meaning. For life to have meaning doesn't mean you own boats and cars and travel and have success and be a be a star so people look at you and adm you're in, in admiration of who you are. That's not success. Success is pleasing God. Knowing that when you lay your head down on a pillow every night that you're in right, right relationship with God and that he loves you and you love him. There's no greater joy and peace to know that your life is counting for something when you, especially as, you're, as a preacher, you're preaching God's truth and no matter how many times you preach it, somehow, some way, someone listening to you, it's helping to change their life to know God better. That's the purpose of preaching. To bring instruction, correction, and righteousness and all these other things. So confess and repent before God for believing the lies of the devil. Next, take back from Satan the ground you've given him. You know, we used to sing that song, Well, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. He didn't steal it. You gave it to him. You surrendered it to him. I should say that's a better word. You surrendered it to him. Devil can't, you know, it's not like Flip Wilson. Oh, the devil made me do it. Devil can't make you do anything. Unless, if he can make you do any, uh, anything, then you're possessed. You have no free will of your own. That's what it means to be possessed. He owns your will. Take back from Satan the ground you have given him. Now I'm talking about in the areas of self-bitterness. You need healing. Next, ask the Holy Spirit to heal your heart. Ask the Holy Spirit to heal your heart. And ask the Lord to tell you the truth about the situation. I'm talking about self. Before we're talking about bitterness and self. Now we're talking about self-bitterness. A lot of the same principles. Believing, ask the Lord to tell you the truth about this situation. Believing the lies of the devil is calling God a liar. <clears throat> when some of these preachers are getting up there and telling people, you don't have to worry, God loves you just the way you are, that's a lie. Nowhere in my Bible have I ever read that God loves you just the way you are. Hello? Anybody ever read that? Please tell me where that scripture is. It's not there. So the question is, if God loves me just the way I am, then why do I need to change? If God loves me just the way I am, then why do I need to change? God loves you because you're his creation. He's created you. So why would he tell us to change? Why would he tell us to put on the, old, uh, the new man and put off the old man? Why would he tell us that? If he was satisfied with who we are. That's why I don't understand some of these preachers. They say, you know, some of these teachers and stuff, they get on TV and they say, oh, this hype of grace stuff and all that stuff. They just tell you, oh, you know, you, you, uh, uh, all your sin is covered. Don't worry about it. You don't need to confess your sin anymore. Do you understand that's going around now? 
There are teachers on television teaching that you don't need to confess your sin anymore because grace covers it all. They're the hyper-grace teachers. Yeah, grace covers it all. You don't need to confess your sins anymore. Now, who, who instituted that teaching? It's the doctrine of a devil. My Bible tells me, confess your sin one to another so that you may be healed. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't care if it's Andrew Womack or if it's uh, uh, Joseph Prince or some of the other ones that are starting to fall, fall into that category. They're liars. We need to not believe the enemy. Because when we do, we're calling God a liar. Well, I don't believe God's going to send anybody to hell. Does anyone believe yeah, God will send somebody to hell? How many believe God can send somebody to hell? One person. Shame on you. You all should know your Bible more than that. Over the years, you heard it say, God doesn't send anybody to hell. You send yourself. Where's that in the Bible? Didn't Jesus say, don't fear the one that can kill the body, but fear the one that can cast both body and, and, and soul into hell? But who's, who's the one that casts the body and the soul into hell? The judge. We don't know our Bible. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. Oh, you know, Pastor, that's the way I've always been and I always will be. Well, that's sad. You don't understand my culture. Yes, I do. The culture has nothing to do with the new nature. Hello? If you're a Christian, you have a new nature. You can keep some of your culture in your practice, but if your culture makes the word of God of none effect, it's tradition. Amen. Hello? Well, next week we're going to get into jealousy and envy. That'll be the next topic. It's already quite a past eight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here. We won't get into jealousy and envy because that'll be a whole other thing. But do you have any questions? Uh, let me just sign off with Facebook. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I've been praying about this. I want you to pray about it too, about doing a uh, maybe a 20-minute, half an hour program on Facebook, one-on-one one -on -one like Brother David does, uh, just to reach out to the community and stuff like that. I'm thinking about doing that. Pray for me, God's wisdom on that, whether I should or not. But anyway, God bless you on Facebook. <coughs> any questions?